iambic pentameter, Petrarchan sonnets, haikus. What? Poetry. The English language is full of poetry, and your Bible is full of poetry as well. So today, <clears throat> on this edition of Theology Thursday, I would like for us to talk about poetry in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's been estimated as much as two-thirds of the Old Testament is in poetry. There's some poetry in the New Testament, but the Old Testament is just packed full of it, and it's a particular type of poetry that's not the same as we have in English. So I would like to try to maybe help us understand a little bit today about how to read and interpret Hebrew poetry and to understand it. Hopefully this will help you uh, to be able to better read your Bible. Poetry is all over the Old Testament. Genesis 2, chapter 2, has the first occurrence of poetry. This is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. We found the song of the sword in Genesis chapter 4. Exodus has a lengthy poetical section called the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15. Leviticus, a little short on poetry. Numbers has, even the book of Numbers has poetry. Numbers chapter 6, that's what's called the blessing of Aaron. Deuteronomy finishes out with about three chapters of poetry. Joshua has no poetry, which makes it rare. Judges has the Song of Deborah in chapter 5 and a few little poetic sections. Ruth has poetry in it. Even 1st and 2nd Samuel have poetry in them. Uh, Kings and 1st uh, and 2nd Kings spatter, spattering here and there. Chronicles has poetry. Esther has poetry. Uh, Ezra has poetry. Nehemiah has poetry. Job is all poetry. Psalms is all poetry. Proverbs is uh, almost all poetry. Ecclesiastes has poetry and prose mixed together. Almost all of Isaiah is poetry. Most of Jeremiah is. Uh, almost all of Ezekiel's poetry. Almost all the minor prophets are in poetry. I mean, it's all over the Old Testament we find poetry. So that said, let's talk about how we interpret Hebrew poetry. So in English, poetry is rhyme and rhythm. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. Um, roses are red, violets are blue. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so that, you know, the, the in line, we have rhyming and then there's a rhythm to it. But in Hebrew poetry, there's really not a whole lot of rhythm. There uh, is some semblance of rhythm. There's one particular Hebrew form called a kina form that does have a 3-2 uh, kind of rhythm, 3 and 2, like limping, and that's because it was a funeral dirge. But for the most part, Hebrew poetry does not, is not based on rhyming, nor is it based on rhythm. Instead, Hebrew poetry is based on two lines, parallelism. Two parallel lines. And so when you have two parallel lines, uh, you can do one of three things with it. Okay. So the first thing that we can do with uh, Hebrew poetry is make it synonymous. So for example, in Psalm 34, verse 1, we're going to find that the first and second lines say the same thing. I will bless the Lord at all times. So I will bless the Lord at all times. Then his, his praise will be in my mouth continually. Like they, they connect. And so the blessing and the praise are the same. The Lord and his, it's his praise. And then in my mouth uh, at, uh, continually and at all times. And so you find the same, the lines say the exact same thing. Uh, they, they, they parallel one another. And then uh, you see that again um, in, uh, <clears throat> it's all over the Old Testament, okay? So that's the first thing we do is make the two lines synonymous where they, they would uh, say the same thing. The second thing that we can do with Hebrew poetry is we can make them antithetical. Um, so in an ant antithetical parallelism, they're opposites. So one of the best examples of this is in the first Psalm, Psalm 1, verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. So the way of the righteous is an antithesis to or the opposite of okay, the way of, of, of sinners, the way of the wicked. You see a lot of these in Proverbs. Do this, but not that. A righteous son is joy to his mother, but an unrighteous son is a heaviness to her heart. You know, that sort of thing, we get that. The opposites, so you find a lot of opposites in Proverbs. So we have antithetical uh, parallelism where the two lines 
say the opposite thing to each other. The third thing that we can do with uh, Hebrew poetry is make it synthetic, meaning that the second line builds on um, uh, the first line. <clears throat> so, uh, for example, in Psalm 3, verse 3, You, O Lord, are a shield around me, so you protect me. The glory and the lifter of my head, lift of my head's idea of, of deliverance. And so you surround me, protect me from enemies, and you deliver me. So they, the second line kind of builds um, on the first. Or verse four, I cried to the Lord, he answered me. He answered me after I cried on him. So the second line kind of builds on the first. And so Hebrew poetry is uh, built, designed around these parallel lines. And so as you read through the Old Testament, when you start reading verses, you start looking at them, you go, okay, so what do we have here that, that we can see as parallels? Now, let me show you why this is important, or, or tell you why this is so important. This does some things for us in researching the Bible. So you start seeing words that are in synonymous parallelism. And you discover that words like righteousness and holiness and things like this are the same. They're, they're synonyms. But also really helps us to understand the way they understood a lot of terms by looking at their opposites. So let me show you what I mean by this, about seeing them as opposites. So in the book of Lamentations, which is all poetry, it's, it's uh, poetry bemoaning the destruction um, of the, uh, uh, of the city. We get into uh, chapter 3, and <clears throat> we start seeing some of these. Remember, so I'm just going to uh, pick up here in um, verse 17. My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. So peace and happiness are similar to one another. They're used as synonyms here. My, my endurance has perished. My hope from the Lord. So hope and endurance are kind of seen as synonyms. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. So wormwood and gall are words that are used sometimes for affliction. So when we see the Bible describing stuff as being like wormwood, we go, oh, we know from this parallel passage that that's an image of affliction. My, uh, my soul continually remembers it, is bowed down to me. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. That's synthetic parallelism. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. So steadfast love and mercies are synonyms. You can see that. So these synonyms really help us see, you know, what a lot of these words and images, especially the images, can mean. But we're going to see the exact same thing from... Uh, the opposites. So if you go, uh, for example, the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter 3, we're going to get a list of, it's funny, this chap, it's chapter 3 in both those, but in, in Ecclesiastes 3, for everything under, there's a season and a time for every matter under the sun, and we'll get a whole list of opposites. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to weep and a time to laugh. And so we start seeing lots of these uh, opposites um, you know, that are in here. And so it allows us to see sometimes what some of these words mean. And one of the ways that we know a lot of Hebrew words mean is by just looking at their synonyms or their antonyms, their opposites that we find in the Bible. So it really helps us to understand a lot of what we're reading um, in the Old Testament. And by understanding this, instead of trying out a distinction between this word and this word, and it was, you know, it's just like you're saying the same thing in both lines to reinforce the statement. So when you read the Old Testament, you, if your Bible is like mine, it probably looks uh, like this, where it's actually arranged in poetical lines. Um, when it's poetry, it makes it much easier. You can begin to look and go, okay, now is that synonymous? Is it antithetic? And here's the opposites. Or is it synthetic? The second building on the first. So I hope this will help you as you read the Bible to understand uh, the poetry and what we find and to... You know, when you see statements like, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, you go, well, that's synonymous. Uh, that's what we have there. 
Um, that's what we see. It really allows it to, you know, to, to go, oh, that's, that's what he's getting at. Um, and so uh, hopefully this will help you, again, to read your Bible, especially because so much of the Old Testament is in poetry uh, to understand the way that it was written. So that said, let me close out by saying, may God bless you and may the Lord be good to you.